Action Agency. Joining us to discuss is Labor MP Peter Khalil and LNP Senator Amanda Stoker. Thanks to both of you for being here. Peter, I might just start with you, if we could. The latest news on the push for a, a federal anti-corruption watchdog is that Bill Shorten faced stiff opposition inside his cabinet room before the election from Labor members, including Anthony Albanese, who opposed creating a corruption-fighting body. Was Albo wrong about that? Uh, morning, Josh and Joanna um, and Amanda. What I know about that is that we took to the last election a policy which was for a National Integrity Commission, a federal ICAC, if you like, and that was a party position. We uh, promoted that policy and talked about it during throughout the election campaign. And the reason we did, and, and that includes Albo and includes all of the leadership team who were supportive of that during the campaign, is because we know that Australians want to see a body that can actually address issues with the capacity to investigate issues at the national level with respect to corruption and restore some of the confidence that uh, we need to have in our democratic institutions. And so uh, I know there's been a bit of a mischief uh, uh, around some of these stories. I don't know where they're coming from. But the fact is, our policy is to have a National Integrity Commission. And that hasn't changed. I'm, I'm just to clarify, I'm not trying to sort of corner you into creating an artificial stoush between you and the, <laughs> the leader of the Labor Party. But uh, when you say you don't know where these stories are coming from, well, the Fairfax Press says that several Labor shadow cabinet members have told the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age that Penny Wong and, and Anthony Albanese and Tony Burke were against the creation of, of such a commission. So I just want to know whether or not you think that their concerns were valid on the substance. Well, I support a National Integrity Commission. Uh, as a backbencher, that, that's my position. I think it's important for our democracy uh, to restore that confidence in our institutions so that we can have the capacity to investigate uh, issues like this at a national level in a coordinated way. So that's my uh, policy position on that. With respect to the deliberations in a shadow cabinet, um, jo uh, Josh, you're going to have all sorts of arguments that go in a shadow cabinet. I wasn't in privy to those uh, conversations. But you're always having long, uh, thorough discussions around policy and the formulation of policy and the, the ins and outs of it and different arguments that occur. What, what is most important, though, is at the end of that process, when you have an agreement by the shadow cabinet and there's a consensus around the policy position, everyone supports that policy position and then prosecutes it uh, as we did in the uh, federal election campaign and as we do now uh, with the need for having this National Integrity Commission. Amanda, the government is pushing hard for this so-called union busting bill to hold union members to account. Why isn't the same applying to members of the federal government? Well, look, I think the coalition has expressed its strong support for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And can I say there's nothing wrong with um, the now leader of the opposition expressing his concerns about what Labor's proposal was that it took to the election, because what it proposed was a couple of principles, back of the beer coaster style, that would have given, um, if implemented, so much power, it would have repeated many of the mistakes of rushed anti-corruption commissions that have been set up in the States. Mr Albanese comes from New South Wales, where the New South Wales ICAC has been guilty of some incredible overreach um, of its powers. And it can show the way that when they aren't designed well, um, anti-corruption commissions can in fact be quite damaging in an unfair, unjust way to people's careers. They can uh, ruin professional reputations and in a way that doesn't necessarily fit with the evidence. So what we've proposed at the coalition level is a Commonwealth Integrity Commission that is properly funded, about, about three times the funding that's being proposed by Labor, and um, that has two divisions. One that deals with law enforcement, that would have public hearings in the way that the existing um, law enforcement Integrity Commission operates, and a second division that would deal with politicians. The way that would work is that there are investigations conducted by this new commission um, in private, and that's important so that um, it isn't abused for political purposes by political opponents, but with the real kicker, and that is that it will refer fully investigated briefs for criminal prosecution to the DPP. <coughs> and that's how we make sure we fairly and fully deal with corruption complaints when they arise. So, Amanda, you say this shouldn't be rushed, but what sort of time frame are you working towards? Well, we're looking to have a complete bill by the end of the year. That reflects a really robust consultation process and the efforts that are being made to ensure that the lessons of the state corruption commissions and where things have gone wrong in their design aren't repeated at the Commonwealth level. That's the kind of good sense policy work you expect from a grown-up sensible government. That's doing it right. 
Let's move on to the second story that we'd like to talk about, which is CPAC, the Conservative uh, Conference, which is which will be taking place. And uh, Senator, you'll be attending. There's been a bit of a brouhaha about exactly whether or not foreign speakers who are associated with alt-right figures should be banned from uh, entering Australia. Uh, what's your position on that? Look, I've got a view that wherever speakers on the left or the right or anywhere in between um, want to come to Australia to share ideas, they're welcome to do so, provided they aren't um, providing hate speech. But that's a term that's being bandied around in a pretty um, unhelpful kind of way. Let's be clear about what hate speech is. Hate speech is speech that incites people to violence. Now, the bloke that's been identified by um, Senator Keneally and co, and they've been carrying on about all week, he's got some pretty odious views on a couple of things. They aren't things I agree with. But it's not hate speech, and no one's being incited to violence. And so in circumstances where we're just dealing with people whose ideas you might not like, the answer isn't to ban them from the country. The answer is for them to be engaged with, to be spoken with, to be debated robustly so that all Australians can benefit from the good ideas rising to the top. That's important for a free and healthy democracy. If we have a situation where we're only able to enter rooms and talk to people with whom we already agree, that's a recipe for a divided society where people who think differently don't engage with one another and that's not healthy. Amanda, in 2016 this man Rahim Kassam tweeted about Scotland's first minister Nicola Sturgeon. He, he said that um, after she had a miscarriage asking if someone could tape her mouth and her legs shut so that she couldn't reproduce. While that might not be directly inciting violence, can't a line be drawn between words and behaviour? Look, I'm never going to endorse words like that, right? They are stupid and they are crass and they are awful. Um, I understand he's also apologised fully for them for what it matters, uh, for what it means. But um, the reality is it's, it's awful stuff. But let him be grilled for that. He deserves to be scrutinised for, um, for that kind of speech. But that doesn't mean you shut him down. It means you put him in a room full of people who think a lot more sensibly and in the process we don't just talk him around but we help all Australians to understand the importance of the much better ideas. Peter, uh, Christina Keneally has said that we, maybe we shouldn't offer a visa to this guy, shouldn't let him into the, into the country, should essentially be sorting out using the immigration system precisely who is allowed to speak in Australia and who is allowed to visit and not. Of course in the past there have been controversies around people like Milo Ianopoulos and Gavin McGuinness who have been declined uh, visas to come and speak in Australia. The point has been made that if Christina Keneally hadn't said this and if there wasn't this brouhaha about it, then mm -hmm. it we wouldn't even know who this guy is. He wouldn't be able to cloak himself in the flag of free speech and say that he's representing a persecuted minority, and we should just ignore it. Is that position right? Well, Josh, a couple of points here, because with all due respect to Senator Stoker, uh, she, she knows who this guy is because she's going to be standing next to him at this conference and speaking uh, alongside him. Uh, so a couple of really important points here. Uh, with all due respect to, to Senator Stoker, hate speech is not just speech that incites violence, OK? That's a fundamental misunderstanding of what hate speech is. Within speech that, where you vilify, which is to abusively disparage a person based on attributes of that person, whether it be their ethnicity, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation or faith uh, or insult or injury there are laws both federal and state in our country which we have led the way with you know starting with the racial discrimination act back in 19 uh, in the 1970s and more recent acts around sex, sexual uh, sex discrimination and other forms of discrimination where we as a society have said we believe it's unacceptable and the law has taken the lead in this. Now she may have a philosophical uh, disagreement with me on this but the law has taken a lead to say it is unacceptable for someone to abusively disparage another based on their attributes as a person. Because that is not what we're talking about with respect to free speech. You, Amanda, can have an argument with someone on a rational level about ideas and so on. That doesn't mean you have to actually abusively disparage someone, denigrate that person based on their ethnicity and, and, and race or their faith. But Peter, that with, is with exactly, due respect, this, that this, is guy exactly, has, this guy hasn't done that in Australia. Well, he hasn't well, broken those laws well, in Australia. Yes. Why are we using the immigration OK, I'll explain department. that to you, Josh, because yep. you mentioned Milo Yiannopoulos as a perfect example. Amanda's own Minister for Immigration used sexual Section 501 of the Migration Act, which allows the Minister to take, have the power to block a, a visa or not uh, award a visa to someone who does vilify 
uh, people based on their race or their ethnicity or, or their gender and so on. And he did so in respect to Milo Yiannopoulos because he made very similar remarks that Qasem has made with respect to Islam uh, in the aftermath of the Christchurch massacre. And in the words of the Liberal Minister of Immigration, he stopped Yiannopoulos from coming and in, entering into Australia because he believed that his statements would ferment division and hatred in this country. And just the second point I want to make about this, this point that uh, Amanda Stoker conflates around incitement of violence. When you, when you vilify uh, and, and disparagingly abuse people on that basis, you may not be directly inciting violence, but it is very, very clear that that is the basis and the fundamental uh, starting point for violence to come from there. Not all hate speech leads to violence, but pretty much all violence towards people of colour or uh, people based on their faith has in, in its progeny um, uh, uh, forms of hate speech. That's why Holocaust deniers are banned. Now, they're not di directly inciting violence, but they allow, they can create the conditions for people to take that next step. Is that, and it's a fundamental question for us as a society, do we want people like that coming in here and fermenting that discord and that hatred and the division. That's very different than having a rational argument on a political level or about philosophies and so on. And free speech has never been absolutely free. You know, Amanda should know that, you know, a famous legal case about shouting fire in a theatre. You just can't have... Uh, un unmitigated, unchecked free speech. And as a society, we have made decisions under the law for normative change to make, make it unacceptable uh, for us to actually abuse people based on their faith or their religion or their gender. And that's what these guys have done. I grew up here in the 70s and 80s. I experienced racism directly. It was overt. It was in your face. OK? We have changed as a society for the better. That doesn't mean racism still doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that kind of prejudice still doesn't exist. But as a society and our laws within that society, we've made decisions, both at the federal and state level, to not accept that. And the law has led the way in that. And I think Amanda's wrong here. And actually, Minister Coleman was right not to let Yiannopoulos in. And they shouldn't allow Carson in as well. All right, Amanda, your response to that? Well, I think in the point about vilification, um, Peter's right to say that vilification can be a part of hate speech, but <coughs> what makes vilification different from just um, speech we don't like is that it prompts action. It prompts people to do something. And we don't have any of that. There has been absolutely um, no crime of hate speech committed by this person, and they have not done anything violent. They have not committed any offences. And so we need to be very careful about overusing this term to censor things that we just plain don't lie. Senator, can I, can I just clarify, just because I think the, the fundamental disagreement between the two of you, it sounds like, is what the parameters of our definition of hate speech is. So yeah, and since, I think that's a big since part Peter, of the debate. Since, 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 since Peter raised the question of Holocaust denial, for example, and also Milo mm. Yiannopoulos, uh, would you say that, it's, uh, that you oppose excluding Holocaust deniers and people like Milo Yiannopoulos from Australia as well? Well, look, I think the, um, the right way to approach visas, and, and this is something on which I um, didn't agree with the... Um, the minister on the Milo question. No, I wasn't around at the time of dealing with the Holocaust deniers. Um, but I think our view should always be um, that we shouldn't be providing political censorship um, in the way that we allocate visas because while it might sound fine in, in this current political climate, it's something that could be very easily used against people of different political views in a different environment. Um, we Where should would you stop draw that, the line, which Amanda? is. I Where beg your pardon? Draw where would you draw the line? Would you stand up next to a neo-Nazi, a fascist? Where, where, where do you draw the line on a philosophical basis? I mean, this is beyond politics to a certain well, extent. There's a point where free speech cannot just be completely unmitigated. Do you, but would you stand next do to incite violence? Would you stand do, next to a neo-Nazi? Neo-Nazis do incite violence. Holocaust okay. deniers would you stand do next to incite a neo -Nazi violence. There's a difference. Hasn't... Would you stand next to a neo-Nazi that doesn't incite violence, that actually uh, espouses Nazi views about well, the way society should be shaped? Look, I think um, I don't hang out with neo-Nazis, right? So I don't know precisely what they're talking about. Oh, well, but, you should um, know. The, I mean, that's a historical Anyone who is talking fact. about Peter, things that incite... Well, I can't hear you, mate. Um, anyone who is talking about things that incite violence um, is committing hate speech. They can be excluded, and they should be. But, but the, people who just have repugnant ideas should be exposed for what they are. It is very, very unhealthy to try and insulate people from ideas that might be challenging because then we lose our capacity as a society 
to be able to argue through and to stop bad ideas. And I don't want to see us lose the ability to be able to smack down bad stuff when it crops up. Right. Peter, you, you had a very good shot at articulating your, uh, your understanding of hate speech, uh, so we'll have to leave that at the last word because we're a little over time. Uh, thanks to both thanks. of you so much. Thanks Great very to talk much. To you.